I am very, very excited, but also very, very nervous to moderate this panel. These are food journalists. I, I, how am I going to interview them? <laughs> I, I'm going to do my best. Um, and and uh, you know, this panel will really focus on the power uh, of storytelling around food and agriculture, especially during you know these kind of. Uh, turbulent political times. So I just want to take a few seconds to introduce them. Their bios are in your programs, um, and you can find more about them and then uh, absolutely talk to them at, at lunch and, and when we have breaks. So we have Michael Gardner, the food writer for the San Diego City Beat. We have Heather Lake, uh, a broadcaster for Fox 5 San Diego. We have Maria Hesse, the magazine editor for Edible San Diego, and Michelle Parente, a reporter with the San Diego Tribune, who gave a, a great shout out to the Very Good Foundation and Food Tank this week, and we're very grateful for that. So thank you. Um, let's give them all a round of applause, please. <laughs> so I'm excited because we have TV, we have online, we have uh, newspaper, we have magazine. I just think it's a really interesting group of people to bring together. And um, after talking to them on the phone, I know they've, they've heard a lot, they've seen a lot, they have a lot to talk about, a lot. Um, so I just kind of want to dive into conversation. And one of the things that I'm really interested in, in hearing about uh, from them and then hopefully from all of you is that you know, we have this question out there of who really is a journalist? When we have folks like Sean Hannity speaking at Trump rallies, or we have CNN reporters being banned for asking tough questions at the White House, what, who is a journalist? And, and why is, is journalism and, and the lines between um, reporting and advocacy becoming so blurry? So I just want to throw that out to all of you. It, again, these are turbulent political times. What is your role as a journalist? How do you compete with sort of pseudo journalists and fake news? We can get into the role of influencers maybe later, but I, who, does anyone want to yeah. start? Michael? I, I mean, I, I think that, that it may be over, overly simplistic, but a journalist is someone who does journalism. And um, that, that, you know, that, that sounds like it's, it's dodging the question, and it, and it is. Um, but it's uh, you know, journalism isn't just putting words on a piece of right. paper or saying them into a microphone. Um, it implies a dedication to the truth. It implies a dedication to um, uh, to the full story. It implies um, uh, a, a willingness to look at things um, and uh, and evidence that may not support what you believe going into sure. the story it's or what you seeking. want to believe. It's yeah. truth seeking. Um, and, you know, we, we have had a, um, uh, you know, a blurring of the, of the lines um, between news and advocacy. We've got, a, we've got, um, we, sorry, we've got Fox News that isn't a news station. We're not related. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've written, I've written for Fox Different News. Different owners. Um, <laughs> and, and it's, you know, it's, you know it, it says news, but it isn't. Um, MSNBC crosses the line um, uh, on the other side. Um, you know, that's not to say there's an equivalency there, but they do both do cross that line. And there is a, 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 you know, something implicit in what they do every day that is other than the, the, the search for truth. And I believe that that means that at least sometimes they're not journalists mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. they're, and they're not doing, and they're not journalists because they're not doing journalism. Absolutely. And I think we can, uh, you know, in, in, in the I food would, side, you can also take yes, a look at Yelp. Jump in. I would say the speed to the, the rate of speed that information is now um, being delivered. It, it sometimes stifles everything that we're doing. Um, for myself, uh, I do a lot of entertaining. I sometimes, uh, you know, I'd like to rest on my laurels and say it was, I was a true journalist at one point, but if you wake up and watch me in the morning show, I'm an entertainer at, at this point. Um, but in the behind the scenes and what people don't know is that I do get to choose what I'm entertaining you with. And so whether I look at a story and I say, you know, I'm gonna go uh, this time of year for Thanksgiving and I'm gonna show this small batch farm that is raising heritage birds. And while I know probably only 5% of my viewers can afford that heritage bird, I'd like for them to know where their food's coming from. And that in San Diego, there's Staley Farms that's trying to do this as opposed to shipping them from all across the country. Um, so I get to make that choice sure. of showing people where their food 
food comes from. Do you um, get pushback from your editors and your producers, nope, though? No. Nope. Really? Uh, there will be a couple of times where if I've shown something maybe too many times in a month or over time, they're like, yeah, we've, we've done that before. Mm -hmm. uh, let's try to do something else. Or, you know, they give me something like today where I showed a five and a half pound burrito if anyone's hungry in the car. No, I'm kidding. Um, uh, you know, a lot of it is entertaining. How do you find the microwave for that? Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking, like, someone needs to make something that you can hold this to go. Like, I, I was like, this is going to be cold in a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, the whole idea is there's a lot where the producers want to show it because of its entertainment value, sure. not because it's healthy or our viewers should really know about it. Um, so there's, there is a, a a mix of that and then back to the timely thing it's you know this needs to be on social media in five minutes it needs to be your article needs to be done tomorrow there needs to be this so the journalistic efforts of you digging into a story when you need to tweet something out in the next 10 minutes mm -hmm. are like let me do some digging hold on google okay you know that's not journalism anymore and we're sure. not getting the time to do a lot of it so people like the ones you see on the stage who are doing and taking the efforts to doing the digging and finding the real stories um, know that sometimes they might not be the most popular on on Twitter or have the most on their feed but when they post a story it's gonna be worth reading absolutely absolutely do you both want to jump in uh, well, I was just gonna add to that I mean with with edible I think we do um, take our opportunity at being a journalistic publication, uh, both online and in print, to have that advocacy element mm -hmm. and really try to inform our readership about where our food comes from. Um, so being, you know, I guess more of a boutique media company, we have that opportunity have to do so. In yeah. A lot of different ways. Definitely. Yeah. A lot more flexibility. Absolutely. Michelle. Right. Whereas we're on the opposite end of the sure. spectrum, right? <laughs> yeah. So my role is to not be an advocate. Um, we're supposed to be, you know, as objective as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but the challenge for food writers <clears throat> who work for, you know, mainstream publications is that we have to write to an incredibly broad audience. So we have to talk to downtown denizens, we have to talk to people in East County, North County, all over, every kind of lifestyle. And so we can't really put out that there's just one way to eat. Absolutely. Um, and every roundup that we do, so we don't only do these like really great stories, we do, you know, best burgers in town yep. because we need clicks too. Yep. Um, but they all have to be from all over the county. Mm -hmm. We can't just, you know, have Little Italy or something. Sure. The biggest challenge for us though these days in who is a journalist is that there's this cadre of food bloggers in town and a lot of them are smart and talented and passionate and they know their stuff but a lot of them are eating for free mm -hmm. and they're on this circuit where they go to all of these media dinners mm -hmm. for free and they never say a bad word about sure. anybody. And I'm not saying that, you know, we should only be looking for the bad word. Of course not. But there's zero objectivity right. when you don't have a full-time job and your paycheck depends on saying nice things. Absolutely. And so we're sort of always put on the same category and we're just not. Um, and the other thing that we have to deal with is that our advertising department often gets confused with the newsroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For many years, we had a columnist named Wolfgang Verkike, hey. Doug Verkike, and his reviews hang in every restaurant in San Diego. Yep. Not every great reviews, restaurant yeah. in San Diego. <laughs> but. And people would say, oh yeah, we've been reviewed in the Union Tribune. Mm. Oh my God, you paid for that. Um, and so there are all of these blurred lines and, and it becomes very difficult to distinguish yourself as an objective voice who doesn't get pressure to write about something and to not write about right. something. Right. Well, and you mentioned bloggers and it's not just bloggers, it's social media influencers. And I, but when we had our prep call for this panel, I shared this story, you know, I get invited I, I'm sometimes considered a journalist, sometimes considered a researcher, and I was on a panel with a real journalist in Chicago and then a social media influencer. And it was the first time that I'd been on a panel with someone like that. And it was just such a sort of jaw-dropping experience for me because I, I do try to be uh, non-biased. You know, Food Tank obviously has, you know, our own viewpoints on the environment and social equity, et cetera. But it was, you know, she gets paid and she talks about it very freely 
to to post stories and so you know that's a lot of competition for you all and I, so I, I want to get back to that how how do you explain to your readers that listen I'm not being paid to tell these stories these are the stories that need to be told yeah look for the hashtag right if it's not an ad then right. you might find a little sponsored. bit more yeah. truth and I think it is um, I don't know that it's competition I, I hope that the public sees the difference, you know, I guess you would hope that, uh, that people are smart enough to, to see that. I don't my, my fear is for young folks who get most of their news from social media that they don't understand that that news is sponsored and that it's not really news. Well, I, you know, I, I've tried to brand myself as a food writer as someone who tells the truth. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I would hope that people recognize that when I say bad things about a place, I mean it. Right. Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that I, you know, I um, that I'm obviously not being paid by them. <laughs> um, right. You know, I, and I think that I, you know, it, it's it's not that that there's no place that's all good or all bad. I'm sure they exist. I haven't found a lot of them. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But uh, you know, if you if if you're looking at um, someone's body of work, and they're all good, then that probably means they're being paid. Sure. And I I mean I. I don't know. I, I'm just not smart enough to come up with a better way to do it than than it to tell the truth. Blunt, yeah. Um, and you know, at least as I see it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not saying that that that, that I'm right all the time, mm -hmm. but I'm telling you that you know, and, and I've br tried to brand myself as someone who says what he believes and has some knowledge about it. That's great. That's great. Do you both want to jump in? Well, I was just going to add to that. I think um, in, in the blogosphere as it is, a lot of it is anecdotal experience. And so it's not substantiated with evidence. There is misrepresentation of different concepts. And, um, you know, in media, I think we... I don't know if everybody else feels this crunch, but we're we're like struggling for the readership and the advertising. I mean, right. it's it's a nonstop marathon to get that engagement. Um, so in a lot of ways, that blogosphere it it uh, takes away our ability to convey the truth mm -hmm. and to share with the public um, the things that that are honest and and true. Yeah. Well, you know, on the flip side, though, I do think like sites like Yelp, which um, people really dismiss in my field, our field. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, you were talking it's about like it before. It's the four-letter word of the industry. <laughs> it is, it is the four-letter word. I find that the democratization of Yelp, though, I really Absolutely. enjoy that because it just shows how much interest there is in food and how seriously people take it too seriously yeah. mm -hmm. every detail like i don't want to read about every morsel that you put in your mouth but i do think that it's great that people are sitting there writing about it they should be eating it and, and enjoying and wait until you go home but sure. for the most part it just really shows an interest in what we consume and the environment in which we consume it and and i like that Absolutely. Michael, you want to add something? We're shaking your head uh, I a little just, bit. I, I mean, <laughs> I'm glad that, um, that people are into food. I'm glad that people are, um, are excited about it. I'm glad that they have a personal relationship with it. Um, I, you know, I, I feel that, um, that Yelp, though, um, in a lot of different ways, both in terms of the way that the company runs itself, the potential for uh, distortions, um, I, and I, its ubiquitousness has cheapened the, mm -hmm. um, the, the field and, um, you know, r th there's a reduction of validity of anything because it is seen um, as the equivalent of Yelp, mm. um, not just the equivalent of blogs, but the equivalent of, of Yelp. And um, there, are, there are no qualifications. Um, you don't have any sense of the background. You don't have any context for the individual who's sure. giving the opinion. And um, so much of, and, and maybe, maybe this is snobby, but so much of it is about conclusions, not reasons. Mm. Um, and you know what we do as uh, you know as food journalists, as food reviewers, that that brand of that that not brand that 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 form of of um, journalism, is we give reasons and we give a context, and that's completely lost with Yelp. And 
what bothers me is it's lost on the people who are reading Yelp. Mm -hmm. um, that's the part that bothers me. That and the distortions, um, the, the the ability of um, uh, the way that they sell advertising in, in order to be able to uh, to take bad reviews off. I that I that just. Both, both as a lawyer and as a, as a journalist, <laughs> that drives me Constant. nuts. Sure, sure. I, well, I, I do want to get into this, um, you know, back to this idea of food as entertainment, right? So we have the Food Network and the Cooking Channel. We have food as sort of a, a spectator sport, but fewer people are cooking at home. Um, more and more people are eating out at restaurants. And um, Maria, I especially want to ask you this question about, you know, there's, there's interest in food, but not always interest in, in the people who are producing that food. And I know that's something that you struggle with at Edible, telling those stories and making them compelling. I mean, they're already compelling to people like us in this room, but compelling to the sort of average person. Right. Um and it's interesting you bring that up because I realized last year, I think it was with the, the social and political sentiments that were going on that um, in a way we were kind of being food elitists mm. because we can't anticipate what the barriers are for the greater public to access you know, the, the ingredients you need just to make one of the recipes in our magazine. And so um, you know, with my background, wanting to make our, our subject matter just, just more accessible, more open, simplify it, tell mm -hmm. people, you know, simple messaging like just eat more vegetables and uh, uncomplicate the recipes and the ingredients and the, and the steps and the things that we were including in the magazine um, to help bring in people and, and increase the interest and then within that share the stories of our food producers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, food is entertainment. We're, we're changing visually our perception, the design and the style of the magazine so that it's more food porny, it's more, you know, appealing to the, the visual eye. Um, I've got my lovely photographer here and she's, she's amazing, you know, and, and it's, it's all um, just a, a labor of love to kind of get that message out because if you can't get somebody to pick up the magazine, it doesn't matter how many farmers I'm writing about. Sure. Um, and you have to find ways to amuse and engage and entice because I, you know, my experience having worked in the food industry and doing what I am now, I realized that, yeah, there's like, we're very niche. There's a much larger population that really doesn't take the time to be mindful or aware of what they're eating and where it comes from. And I'm, you know, I, I kind of balance in between that because it, it's reality. Absolutely, absolutely. But that's that's where we're going. We're trying to we're trying to just simplify the message and, and hope that everybody kind of engages in between. Sure. M Michelle, you don't only write about food issues. You do write only about food? No, I, right. I write oh. about um, that other vice in life, casinos. <laughs> right. Um, right. So right. not only do I not tell you to go eat um, <laughs> really good food, I tell you where to go spend your money. Um, yeah, the, I write about lifestyle issues uh -huh. as well. Um, I have a hard news background. Right. Um, very hard news. I worked in New York for a long time covering crime. and Hardcore. Hardcore. <laughs> I love writing about food in casinos. <laughs> I have the best job. You were death threats? Uh, well, actually, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, no. Yeah, so Good was that earlier. question to lead me well, to something? Well, I, I did want to ask you, I mean, I know it's hard. So we have some of these big issues going on right now. The wildfires, we have drought, we have climate change as this overarching issue right. that really affects us all. Right. How do you tie those issues into the food stories that you're writing about? Can you? How difficult is it? Um, well, you know, they don't necessarily want me who needs to produce special sections every year. I mean, every couple of months on casinos. And now I'm working on our an end of the year dining guide. Sure. And, you know, we just did a holiday guide. They don't necessarily want me saying, well, I'm going to go write about how this farm is doing from the wildfire. Mm -hmm. um, I can suggest things. I can, you know, every once in a while, I'll jump in on something like that. I wrote about the drought in the Valle de Guadalupe when we were doing a lot of our drought coverage. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, they're, they're not really looking to me to do that. And I actually would prefer to stay a little bit away from that. 
<laughs> but you did tell me, and am I wrong that you told me when you were writing about the wine industry in the region that drought came up and, and that seemed to be something that resonated with readers? Oh, yes, it did. And then also... Um, because it affects alcohol. I it, mean, <laughs> yeah, wine is a More very water popular water. topic for people. Um, but I think the story that's gotten the most response in the past six months was the pact that was signed to bring treated Tijuana sewage water mm. to irrigate the crops in the Valle de Guadalupe. Mm. Um, and most people were really positive about that because it's a real solution to... And they understood it? Yes, they understood it. And that's thanks to reporting like yours. Well, I don't know if I, yeah. But I, I mean, I think so, right? Because I, I think what people would normally hear that story and be like, what the, right. you know, the what F is drinking? that? And, right. and, and, but if you can explain it clearly and give the news, I, I think that helps people understand these issues better and then support them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think we'll see a reciprocation of those types of policies and developments happening here as a result of that, though? That's where I feel like we um, have opportunity to just convey the stronger message, like that article. Um, it's, it's important, which is what we try to do with what we're reporting on as far as how climate change is affecting our crops. I'm talking to Michael right now about ways that we could manage our water table better here in, in San Diego. Mm -hmm. um, so there are all those big overlying environmental issues that definitely need to be addressed through the story of food and it food is enticing so i think i think it's it's a good um vehicle i guess to motivate people to well and food and water interest. are are completely um inseparable i mean you can't grow Absolutely. you can't grow crops without water um you can't grow grapes without water um and, and you know it's uh, it, Telling stories, it, it's always got to be something that people can relate to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, they, they need to be able to relate it to their own lives. They need to be able to see the effect of it. They need to be able to feel the effect of it. And I think that ultimately that's all done through people. Um, it's all done through characters. Um, and telling the stories of characters. Well, putting a face to these putting issues. A face. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, we just we just all saw it. Um, you know, you, you know, how many times um, have, have 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 you heard about Lyme disease? Um, did you understand it until you had someone explaining it to you? Not just explaining it to you, showing it to you, yeah. showing it on her face, yeah. showing it in, in 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 her voice. I mean, those are the those. That's how. That's a, a big part of our jobs is to find characters that can convey ideas. Um, that can embody ideas, and I, I mean, I think that uh, that you know Michelle's um, uh, story about the Valle de Guadalupe. There was that that was uh, that was a part of it, and that's you know I think that's that may be why it was so successful. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, it's it, it's those people, it's those characters that make the difference. He Heather, can you jump in here because you're putting people on air who are telling their stories? Can you oh, talk sure. about that? Um, you know, going out, we did a lot of um, segments out at these new wineries. I mean, that was Ramona had somewhere around like 20 different wineries in it and I find just these little niche opportunities to show people of the county and what they're doing to make a living and mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of people this is kind of their second lot at life. Uh, I, people that I interview it's so interesting to see um, in your 40s nowadays it's like second career is maybe somewhere in food industry or farming or restaurant or brewing. A lot of brewers. Uh, we're thirsty in San Diego. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it's interesting to see. They're like, you know, I had these avocado farms and now we have less water. So now I'm growing grapes. And I think that's the story told time and time again. And the more that we see people and we put their faces on air and the more that I'm at an organic farm and I'm seeing um, this woman talk about or a man talk about you know why they're there mm -hmm. and why they're mm -hmm. doing what they're doing whether it was a disease that they had when they were younger or whether um you know this is a family farm that they've grown into and now they have a market in san diego and people are so excited about eating healthier um it, it is it's important to put these faces um behind food and the story of or you could talk about um with the feeding san diego you know when I, when we mention their stories i mean it's so interesting to see the people that they're feeding and, and then i have a family coming forward on air talking about how they're so grateful with what they're doing because they're able to eat for an entire summer because of their summer program mm -hmm, their kids mm -hmm. wouldn't eat lunch and other you know in other words so it, it does take a special story and a special way of putting these faces on camera and i'm so glad that they want to be on camera because a lot of the time they don't mm -hmm. um so mm -hmm. so yeah it does make a difference 
I, I, I want to get into this um, question of, of good news versus bad news. So Food Tank uh, was founded on this premise that we wanted to highlight stories of hope and success. You know, I, I come from an environmental uh, background. I worked for a think tank in DC that was very, uh, you know, informative, but very gloom and doom. And so I want you all to sort of weigh in on, you know, bad news unfortunately gets a lot more clicks or a lot more viewers in, in some cases. How do we combine that with telling the, the good news as well? I, I sometimes find that I feel like I'm a cynic because I try to appreciate others, you know, perspectives or the reality of what it's what it's like to be sick and battling cancer if you're, you know, working two jobs and uh, you don't have access to the nutrition that you need to support your health. Um, so I'm trying to always symp sympathize, I guess, with, with those people. Um, and I think that's where the the you know greater part of the public kind of identifies with that bad news mentality because we all have our struggles and we're all wanting to find a connection with other people that are going through something like us um, in, in that regard. I try not to be cynical though because you're always trying to find that you know that that brighter side to the st story, the success of, of what can happen through the power of positivity and food. And um, I guess it's just, you know, the constant circle that, that goes. There's the good and the bad. And mm -hmm. it, it's balanced reporting that shares that. Well, I, I think, right? again, it, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I think again, it, it's through people and through the story of people and mm -hmm. through characters. Um, and you know, you can you can you can look at the um, at, at the problems that that we face in the in the um, food system. Uh, you know, big ag, big beef, big um, you know, uh, you know divisions. Um, you know, a, a attempts by uh, by moneyed interest to buy out uh, you know, people who are um, pro proposing uh, solutions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, you can also tell the stories of people. Who have managed to turn that around? Mm -hmm. I did a story on Brant Beef, um, I, you know, a couple of years ago, and talked about how Eric Brant, um, you know, got his uh, his dad to, um, you know, help him um, find ways to turn their, you know, one of their um, their, their costliest things, manure, mm -hmm. into a resource, right? Absolutely. And, and and go to the bottom line, telling the story of uh, you know of him being out on the, uh, you know, uh, with the manure and getting uh, on the walkie-talkie, Eric. Your turd flippers here, <laughs> um, you know, and, and he's the joke of the entire place sure. until the until the, they see the effect right. uh, on the bottom line, right. and and you know you can tell the bad, but also through a character. Um, tell some of the good Absolutely. and show some of the good and let people relate to that and and you know you don't ignore either side. Heather, did you want to add to that? I mean, I I am one of the people on the morning show that like when there is doom and gloom, it's like it's Heather's three minutes and <laughs> it's sunshine and rainbows. So <laughs> I don't really have this side of the story. If anyone's watched the morning show, they know it's like, okay, Heather's at Disneyland. Okay, she's doing cartwheels with the kids. Like, so it is like I kind of get that moment to just be the silver lining of everything. Sure. And I appreciate it. I love what I do. And I love being able to share all of these stories with people about you know rescuing food um, people who are just so smart in San Diego that are um, uh, taking imperfect produce and putting it in the hands of people who yeah. don't have it and these are these are what I just call these moments right where there's fires there's uh, crime there's politics and then there's me and I think a lot of people don't realize that I get to choose Absolutely. what I do and there's so many we have such a skeleton staff unfortunately nowadays that there's not a lot of pushback they don't sure. look at me and tell me oh you're not gonna do that today they're like oh good we've got three minutes to fill and Heather's gonna make a smile mm -hmm. you know so so thankfully I get all of this opportunity mm -hmm. to find people and hopefully some of you in this audience that have great ideas um, I think I mentioned though a lot of the pitches that I get um, so a lot of the work I have to do is kind of siphling through all of these pitches of you know National Grilled Cheese Day and 
National Pepperoni. I, I didn't even know I there were so many house. toppings many for pizzas in National Days. <laughs> um, they all exist. Like, it's National Add Olives to Your Pizza Day. Um, put your pants on with your right leg first day. Not pineapple. Just please, no pineapple. I don't know. I just never knew. And so, yeah, and so for me, I just hope to find more ideas and better ideas that get families around the table at the end of the day mm -hmm. and solve solutions to food problems that we have. And, and luckily, I get to share that. So, cool. yeah. yeah. Do you want to add anything, Michelle? Well, we have the um, interesting position of having both a large print product and a large online platform. Mm -hmm. And the behavior of our readers are so different. Really? So in the print, you know, they want the longer in-depth pieces, but they're always telling us that they want positive stories. Mm. We hear a lot about there's so much gloom and doom. Please give us something to smile about yeah. every once in a while. So our editor has created a couple of avenues for that. One is called Making a Difference, where we, ha we feature someone who's making a difference in the community. People really like those. Online, however, no matter how much everybody tells you that they really want to read international news, they want the 7-Eleven that was held up in Mira Mesa and anything about the Chargers still. <laughs> Chargers. Aww. And um, especially now that they're winning again, you know, we're yeah. fair weather, far away fans as well. Um, and then luckily for us, anything that has to do with food, any kind of list any kind of Let's best work. of top <laughs> this and that it works yeah my print stories profiling the chef who's been you know the the founder of san diego's farm to table movement jeff jackson mm -hmm. one of the founders you know it's good for print but it got nothing online yeah. people don't want to read that stuff online it's because so. it takes longer than 90 seconds well yeah <laughs> they want um, to see a burrito the size of a baby yeah, yeah. Right. 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 <laughs> lots of pictures <laughs> lots it was of, a good photo i promise lots of food porn you know <laughs> and so we have to balance that and luckily we get to do both right you know we don't have to choose we can we can do both because frankly it's fun to do our roundups mm -hmm. we get yeah. to eat everywhere right right yeah. that's very <laughs> Exciting. Heather, you brought up an interesting point about how um, food loss and food waste has really attracted a lot of media attention over the last five years. And it's one of these issues that people like me have been studying for a long time, and it's great to see it getting so much play. What other issues are you all seeing that are getting that kind of play in, in food and agriculture? Um, I, th I, you know, the food loss and food waste, I wonder if it's media attention or if it's the fact that in San Diego we have so many smart chefs that are bringing the attention to the media. Because I'll be honest, um, I wasn't the one doing the digging. I found out because there were all these events with chefs that I know and love that were like, hey, we're doing this really cool charity event and we're gonna be doing dishes only using our scraps. And I was like, that's kind of cool. Or they're doing a special D on Friday and we're using all these things. We wanna show you how we're taking our waste and doing A, B, C, and D with it. Um, and so I would do a couple of morning segments going out and showing you know how they do their compost or what the back of their kitchen looks like um uh, a lot of the issues that are brought to our attention at least for me is because we have some really awesome local chefs that yeah. are innovative and and cool and i'm trying to think of what they're doing next that they kind of have brought attention to but yeah i mean a, a lot of um I mean, we're not getting any water, so that that's not helping our organic farming sure. um, right now, which has been brought to my attention for sure. But I think the food waste has been a big one. And then, uh, oh, I will say one thing. It's kind of uh, the CSA box thing changing. So there's there's local boxes that are trying to say they're CSA, and and you all of a sudden get this box, right? And and I need to do some more digging on this, but it, it's covered in, in vegetables with plastic wrap and mm -hmm. all of the, um, these local things. And and I was like, well, wait a minute, why are my tomatoes not ripe? And what is happening here? And so oh, it yeah. took me calling a local farmer and asking what's happening, and it's sort of this. Um, 
this idea of this monopoly happening and kind of putting some of our local farms in a bad place. Absolutely. Um, and I'm at the really at the, the start of trying to figure out what's sure. going on here. And I don't you, know about you, you were, guys. <laughs> to, that, to that effect, um, I was in Rancho Santa Fe, um, was it like a week or two ago? And I was driving along the side of the road and there's the $5 avocado stand sign. Right. And I pulled over and I was about ready to bust out the $5 until I realized that it was a produce distributor from Chula Vista, like a really obscure, you know, little marker on the van setting up a table. So he's not even a real avocado farmer yeah. out there. He's just kind mm -hmm. of exploiting the opportunity in the location to, you know, make mm -hmm. it look like that, which I think, um, you know, it jeopardizes our small farms that are you know, highly dependent on CSA subscriptions. Mm -hmm. uh, even some of these cooperative um type deals where you see larger entities purchasing produce from the smaller farms. I mean, they're still benefiting the smaller farms, but they're gathering from a number of different farms to put all this produce into the box. And that's where it's like, okay, well, where is it coming from then? Because that transparency is now lost. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. What, what other issues are you seeing that I, are kind of trendy that deserve more legs? I mean, I, I, I actually think that unfortunately, um, you know, we don't want to pay a lot of attention to issues. Mm. Yeah. We really don't. Yeah, I no. mean, you know, I, I, I'd love to have six answers for you, but the fact is that, um, that, that I don't see people caring mm -hmm. about issues. I think that, uh, you know, the trend that has been happening for a long time and I, I don't see going anywhere is, uh, you know, plant-based food. Mm. Um, uh, you, know, you know, hashtag plant-based no waste is, is, you know, is big and it's getting bigger and we're, um, and it's beginning to get to the point where it is truly, um, you know, capturing the public's imagination. Um, not that everyone's going vegan. Um, you know, uh, everyone isn't. It's not going to happen. No, but I was going to actually veg. say that, that 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 is the single thing that people ask me about the mm -hmm. most. Mm -hmm. Where can I go for great vegan food? Um, and when we do a roundup and we don't have a vegan option in there, we hear about it. Sure. People are very interested in plant-based diets. Sure. Yeah. Well, wasn't yeah. the new Monopoly, the Millennial Mon Monopoly was released uh, overnight? And that was like one of the experiences is going to a vegan restaurant. Oh, no way. <laughs> Breaking news. <laughs> I would great. hope to that effect that regenerative agriculture and land management practices become a trend because we really need um, that to take off and start affecting, I think, policy on a, on a greater level, both, you know, countywide, citywide, statewide and, and nationally. Absolutely. You so. can clap. People can clap. Go, go regenerative farming. <laughs> The one other story that um, that's kind of uh, kind of related um, I, that I see getting a, a lot of public attention is um, trash in the ocean, plastic in the ocean, mm, the Pacific straws, gyre. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I see that as something that 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 people don't yet know how to get their heads around. Sure. They understand um, at some level where it's coming from, um, and and yet they just there hasn't been enough really good storytelling yeah. about it that they can um, they can know how to process it right um, and I, I, I've heard some of the same people who have talked to me about that um, then say why can't I have a plastic straw <laughs> uh, you know and it's and and I don't I don't even fully blame them um, yeah there's it's, it's it's tough to understand how you hold both thoughts in your head sure. but it's but but they but I don't blame them because it's you know they don't uh, they haven't been shown that mm -hmm. we haven't shown it to them mm -hmm. Yeah. in a way well, that they can relate to. And then going back to the blogosphere, you have the person who's showing off their green juice and their plastic cup mm -hmm. and going, oh, look, I used my stainless steel straw today. And I'm like, how do you not see what's wrong with that? Sure. <laughs> because you're in the plastic cup. So it just, you know, anyways, um, <laughs> that's my rant on plastic straw. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to make sure the audience can ask you some questions. So I, I want to shift to Q&A right now. And I already see hands up. And the roving mic is coming down this way. There's somebody in the front who raised her hand first. So I want to go to her. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so my name is Stacy. Um, this is Hits Home. I actually graduated with a journalism degree, and I've been a social media specialist for five years. Um, actually, I work with Dr. Bronner's. And of the many things that the company talks about, regen, you know, regenerative organic agriculture, is uh, a huge one at the forefront for more than the past two years. Um, 
And a lot of the things that you guys have touched upon are things that, you know, I sort of struggle with in terms of how to make that discussion sort of sexy. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that the more thorough investigative pieces, some of the blog posts that we've done profiling farmers, uh, you know, may not get as many likes, shares, views as one simple quote, you know, uh, or sort of the quippy kind of one-liners, Reddit style, almost humorous kind of content or really dry sense of humor kind of content that can get literally, you know, 20,000 shares uh, in two days. Yep. So is, you know, I would love to hear from actual food journalists about how to sort of talk about this, you know, something like soil health, uh, you know, no till or low till, how to talk about that in a way that's through people, captivated. through people, through characters, yeah. by you know helping, uh, you know helping people relate to the idea through the story. We just um, in September published our protein power issue, which you know we worked on planning for about a year, and within that, you know we wanted to identify what has been accepted as the the general norm for proteins. You know we've been a, a society that's conditioned to believe that chicken, beef, pork, uh, seafood these these are the only types of proteins you can eat. Um, so keeping that in mind, we wanted to look at you know the the nutritional aspects of that in three parts in in these articles: the so nutritional aspects, the environmental impacts, and what our local connections are for, for resources. Um, and we collaborated with Bastyr University to share recipes. And I think that format, because it was, mm -hmm. it was a four-part article for each uh, topic, was uh, engaging for the readers because there was something light. And it, you know, it wasn't like we went really in-depth with the explanations that we gave, but we, we gave you know, surface information that would allow people to go and investigate for more, more if they wanted. Making something engaging is the key. And using a person to sort of personify the story is great. But you also have to give readers uh, a rationale. Why am I reading this? Why is this important? And oftentimes, a lot of stories can sound like a research paper. Mm -hmm. And you know, you'll know, you read it, uh, but you'll just barely get through it. And what will you take away from it? So you can try to break information out, explain it, speak to people. And I don't mean dumb it down, but speak to them in colloquial English and not in technical jargon. terms mm -hmm. and jargon, because a lot of it is policy wonk. And that's not fun. You have to make it fun for people. Well, and I think, you know, uh, along those lines, um, we who are concerned, we on the left, um, we um, who are concerned about the environment, are cons we, we tend to use a lot of jargon. We tend to use words that, that you know, we can speak to each other um, I, using, those, using that kind of language. But when you're talking to the public, they, you know, they miss one of those words, and they and you they lose you the entire them, yeah. meaning Eyes of it. Eyes glaze over. Yeah, yeah I, exactly. Um, and and I think that 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 point, Michelle, is really key. It was absolutely key. Speak to them in language that they are going to understand. Statistics seem to be really effective. I mm -hmm. think charts. Just, yeah, simple. Mm -hmm. And somewhere in your in your headline, in your first, you know, four lines of text, it needs to be teasing them into why this is important to them in a way they can understand. Thank you. Other questions? Let's hit this side. I just want to say thank you so much. I feel like it's been a really dynamic conversation with a multitude of perspectives. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about the death of Jonathan Gold this year and the spirit of community that he really brought to his writing, because food is a real opportunity to create that connection with a really diverse readership. So I would just love to hear the panel's uh, thoughts on how they work, how you all work in your various uh, modes to, to build that sense of community around the subject of food. Well, I, from, from my perspective, um, I mean, the, the, the dual loss of um, Jonathan Gold and, and, and Anthony Bourdain um, hit me very, very, very hard. I mean, those are two, um, those are two people who um, have had a tremendous influence on my life and, and, on, and what, um, what I'm doing. And, you know, the, one of the big things that I have always, you know, I, like you, I've, I've had the, um, the good fortune to be able to pick my subjects uh, almost Every single review I've ever written was one that I chose, mm -hmm. um, and and you know, 
like gold, I've really tried to focus on um, well over half of my um, uh, you know, my reviews on little ethnic local places, people who are part of our community who are um, otherwise overlooked by large portions of mm -hmm. our community and that's you know that's really um, part of what I've tried to do and to you know to bring to it kind of the um, the the multifaceted um, uh, approach that was Bourdain um, so that's that's how I've tried to do it taking from from that same kind of sentiment we're focusing on sharing stories more about relationships within our food community a lot of times you'll see profiles about what this one chef is doing but that chef is not that chef without the army of people he has behind him supporting him um, and, and the same goes you know for our food producers and, and and our consumers as well so you know for us I think um, trying to improve the the diversity of what we're representing on our pages um, and and sharing those stories that are about the community and about the people that is what will help us all engage with each other on a greater level that's what I kind of love social media for in mm -hmm. a way. I know there's like so many reasons maybe not to like social media, but for me, people have so much access to just me as mm -hmm. a human. They don't have to go through the newsroom. Mm -hmm. I can find any mom and pop store and they can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, message me. And tomorrow we can be working on a segment about something so um, small and niche that uh, uh, bringing people together and talking right. about, Talk about where about they were. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. it's pretty amazing. That's awesome. Can we get one more question from over here? And I think then we'll cut it off. It's not actually a question. Um, my name is Kenyatta. I, I work for- I love questions though. <laughs> <laughs> I like I, questions with a question mark at the end. That's what we try to do here. Sort of a question. <laughs> um, you guys said you were looking for a feel good story. I'm with uh, Terry in Oceanside. We serve, you know, Terry, adults and children with autism and other intellectual and developmental disabilities. We're very big on sustainability and how food really affects your health. And if you're looking for a feel good story, this is our farm manager, and uh, we have 20 plus organically certified microgreens that we produce. Our students actually cut those, package them, and deliver to 22 restaurants throughout San Diego. So if you guys are looking for a feel good story, please uh, come see us. <laughs> and I'm sure there are a million of those feel good stories in this room. So I hope you yeah. all can yep. stay and, and yep. learn to network with, uh, or to. get a chance to network with some of these folks. I wanna thank these panelists. You've all been amazing. I really appreciate you.